Hello everyone, kia ora tato, and welcome along, haere mai, to Showy Overeats, a podcast where I, potentially perimenopausal Penny Ashton, do a deep dive into the mysterious hormonal hocus pocus that is menopause by chatting to various fabulous women and trans individuals about their own menopause journeys. And yet another reminder that I am clearly not a doctor though I did play a gynecologist once on Shortland Street for three whole episodes, but that doesn't qualify me for anything except a small IMDB entry. So seek proper medical advice if you feel that you need it. But today's guest is so fabulous that she was in around 60 episodes of Shortland Street and New Zealand agrees with her fabulosity and she was awarded New Zealander of the Year 2020. So please welcome Jennifer Ward Leland to Showy Ovaries. Hooray, kia ora to you. Kia ora, Tēnā koe. And ke te pehe koe, how are you? Paiana, paiana. Excellent, good. You are an absolute inspiration with your tadeo. So can you tell me what showy ovaries is in tadeo Māori? Yeah, I've had a look up for the word, because there are a couple of words for ovaries, and one is hua kuwal. Now, hua is, means to, it can be a noun and a verb, and it can be to bear fruit. Right. To blossom. Okay. Or to have value, which I oh, really like. It is really nice. And kuwal. Kuau is the young of animals. Oh, right. But the other name for ovary, uh, ovaries is fari kano. Could they fari, could they house? Yeah. Yeah. And then kano is seed or grain. Right. So it's what the house that holds the seed. Isn't that beautiful? That's so poetic. Yes, that's, that's te reo Māori for you. So, so beautiful. Right. And, and I thought it was really interesting around women and pregnancy and the cycles that we go through that, of course, whenua, means the land or the ground, but it also means the placenta. Ah. Who means the kinship group or the family. It's also to be pregnant. Iwi means the tribe or the nation, but it also means your bones. So see how much oh, yeah. the land, the family, all of that is all in, in, entwined. That's yeah. so Placenta amazing. and the earth being, yeah, which absolutely, it gives life, it feeds, it's the soil. that Yeah, that, yeah. 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 both from right. the tangata to the tangata and the whenua. Right. The the well, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. So now how is your lockdown coming along? You're in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. My lockdown is is fine. Obviously, uh, all of my work pretty well now until the end of the year has gone. Yes, me too. So it's tumbleweed, various little bits and pieces, voiceovers, but everything is wanting to move to 2022, and I completely understand that. Look, I feel... I feel okay. I feel very privileged. I have a nice house to live in. I've got food on the table. I'm not struggling. I, I miss being with all of my people, my arts people. I miss being able to get on the stage and all of that stuff. And I'm sure you absolutely know how that feels, Penny. Absolutely, indeed. Yes. Last lockdown, I guess because we've had a bit of experience, even though this has been longer, I did go through a, a, a few days of thinking, oh, maybe I, I need to retrain. Maybe my 40 years as an actor is maybe I'm done maybe no one wants that anymore and then after a few days I just reminded myself that actually freelancing is kind of like that and you never know what's coming up and, yeah, that's and true. so that was okay so I know that I know that things will come back yeah um, yeah I just have to I'm, I'm just not buying into being angry about it I'm not buying into everybody's different takes on it I'm keeping myself a more mentally healthy I think that way yeah. Other people want to do the deep dive, but as long as I know the statistic, what we can and can't do, I'm fine with that. Absolutely. Did you come up with something that you would retrain as? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. Um, I mean, I have my finger in quite a few pies, but, you know, within the performing arts world, but, yeah. but all of them require people relating to people. Yeah, me too. Or, them, or teaching them or speaking to them or something, yeah. apart from voiceovers, which you can do in a studio. And that's the only work that I have done. I have, was a voice of a Power Rangers monster through yeah. all of this is the yes. o- only thing, yeah. And I marry people, of course, and that involves people as well. So, yeah, people, people, people. Ah, yes, of course. Yes, you're yeah. a celebrant. That's right. Yeah, I am. Yes, indeed. Inspired by our first guest, Pinky Agnew, to be a celebrant. Ah, yeah. yes. So, so, yeah, look, you know, it's not that I couldn't do other things, but nothing really gives me as much of a buzz as performing and teaching and directing yeah. and all of that. But I tell you what, I have been doing an enormous amount of union work right. throughout this lockdown. Myself and, and the board, we've been oh, having actors meetings and 
a meeting with ministers and meeting with MPs and meeting with the guilds and, and all sorts of people for our cast local campaign. So that has been keeping me very exercised. And also the short film that I just directed was accepted into the New Zealand International Film Festival. And even though Auckland's showings got cancelled, oh, it's going right. to go on in Wellington. So hopefully crossing fingers, I can go down there for the opening there. So lots of publicity around that and, you know, various bits and pieces that come up. Right, okay. And that's with Aroha Awaro? Should- Aroha Awaro wrote that and, and co-produced it and Piata Melbourne produced it and that's called Disrupt. So we're very excited. And it plays in Hawaii. We got accepted into the Hawaiian Film Festival, so it plays in Hawaii on the early November, I think. Fantastic. Right. Well, now I've actually written you quite a fulsome introduction. It's quite difficult. As I say, I keep inviting very impressive ladies on and then trying to summarize them into short, pithy paragraphs. But here we go. So brace yourself. It's actually not that short. Jennifer Ward Leland is one of New Zealand's most recognizable and prolific actors. From her first role on Close to Home in 1978 to the latest season of The Broken Wood Mysteries, she's never been far from a stage or set and flits between the two with ease. She trained with Theatre Corporate, was a founding board member of the Watershed Theatre and the Actors Programme, has featured in innumerable productions, including theatre, musicals, cabaret and solo cabaret, has directed theatre and short films and appeared in a plethora of TV productions. She is a fierce ally for the rights of performers through her work with Equity New Zealand, is an advocate for Te Reo Māori, which propelled her New Zealander of the Year nomination, is a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit, and has won numerous awards celebrating her influence and all-round legendary status. But my favourite things to mention is that in 1994, she starred in a film I remember so vividly when I saw it because I was 20, which was Desperate Remedies, and I bloody loved it and it could have been Kevin Smith's shirtlessness that had something to do with that, but I remember that so well. And only yesterday it was announced that she will be in the cast of The Unruly Tourists by New Zealand Opera next year, which I'm equally fascinated about. So again, I welcome Jennifer Ward-Leland. Hooray, hooray, hello. Lovely to be here, Penny. Thank you. Thank you very much. So do you ever just sit back and, and think through all of that 40 years and just go, yeah, man, I did that? Sometimes I look back and go, my God, you were ballsy doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I do look back and go, wow, you did that one person show with the orchestra and wow, and would you do that now? But actually, I'm always looking for challenges. Yes. And, and, I, but, and if you'd asked me five years ago, would I be a qualified intimacy coordinator? I would have said what? Oh, that's right. I meant to include that. So you just trained for that recently and you've been working on set. Yeah, I've been working uh, over the last, well, coming up for three years now and um, just recently got fully accredited. So I've been under the mentorship of Ita O'Brien and you might have seen her beautiful intimacy coordinating in normal people or sex education. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So I've been under very, very good mentorship and training. Right. And I've been coming up for now 40 productions, screen productions and, and uh, that I've worked on in the last couple of years. So that's been amazing and has made a huge, huge difference to actors. Yeah. And and consequently to their mental health. Absolutely. I mean, when you hear the horror stories from the 70s, like where actors are not looked after and thrown into horrendous situations, which actually have massively lasting effects on their mental health, having someone to advocate for them in those roles is so important. So true. And I wish it was just the 70s, Penny. Yeah. Yeah. I would say 90 5% of the people that I work with have had some difficult situation. Wow. The very worst it could be that it was actually sexual assault. At the very best, it just wasn't communicated well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nobody nobody talked about it and the actor was very much alone. There was no one to advocate for them. There was no one to make a professional process. And I I think that's probably one of the things that I'll I'll be most mm, proud about is that I've been able to embed best practice into the training institutions in our country. Oh, right. Yes, absolutely. At the core. Drama school students will come out with an expectation that there will be a professional process around those scenes, which is, as we know, a legitimate part of our work. Oh, absolutely. Do you think the Me Too movement has propelled this? Definitely. But we were, at Equity, we were onto it before that. We'd started doing guidelines for actors before that, I think 2015. And then, yes, it was much, you spoke about it much more when Me Too hit the fans. So Fantastic. Right. Okay. Well, this sort of leads into a little bit into my first question. And I've been asking everybody this question and the range of responses has been from celebrated to heartbreaking. But what would you say that your relationship with your body has been like through and what journey has that been on through your life? 
Yeah, I think it's been generally okay. I felt even better about my body once I'd had babies. Right. Because I saw that, and it's not that my body looked better or anything, probably the opposite, but I just thought, what a miracle. Right, absolutely. I felt so intensely grateful for this body that could give birth and that it was such a hugely creative thing. I had both my babies at home and I really, you know, it's not to say it doesn't hurt, I'm not romanticising it, it does hurt, but I love the experience of that. I find it really powerful. And just to go, wow, you grew a baby, you grew a hu- you grew two humans. Totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now I go, well, I'm probably not going to be prancing around in the nick anymore. Right. Um, but, you know, on stage or screen or whatever. <laughs> but on the whole, I think it served me pretty well. Right. Fabulous. Mm. It's funny because I have no desire whatsoever to have children and I never have, but Mm. I have pondered that as well. Just that miracle of just from nothing to a human being is is quite remarkable. So It is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I look at women and I go, well, no wonder you're tired. You're growing a spine. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Your your first trimester is that's the time, isn't it, for that sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. You're you're inventing a person inside you. Right. Yeah. Well, well, that's good. And had you, you know, so you felt that change, but um, from having children. But has there been other shifts that you felt through the length of your life with regards to your corporal being? Well, obviously, the 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 obvious one is menopause, and that's what we're yeah. talking about. Yeah. So that has been uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And um, I mean, do we go on and talk about this now? Yes. Let's, you, that was an yeah. excellent. It's like you're a professional. That was an excellent segue. segue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so before we get to how it's affected you, did you know anything about it beforehand? I would say no. Yeah. Not really. I don't think anybody talked about it. And it's probably why I'm so, <laughs> whenever I see women around my age, I'm like, how's your menopause going? And sometimes <laughs> they look at me a little askance. and like, what? why is she asking me this? Because no one talks about it. Mm-hmm. And so I'm really, I'm interested to know what people are going through. Are you are you through it? Are you halfway through it? Are you perimenopausal? What's happening? I'm, let's just talk about it. It's the same thing with periods and menopause. They all sort of get sort of shunted over there of being a little bit, uh, bit icky and yep. you've still got blue food colouring for periods and stuff like that in, in television commercials. So I figure it's really great and I'm often talking to younger women about it too. Firstly saying, you will just love not having your period. All right. What a freaking thrill that is not to have that anymore. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you what, for an actor, there was always such a, oh, such a pill when you go, oh, God, it's opening night and I'm going to be on day two. Yeah, wow. And when you're the most sort of, you know, why am I crying? Um, <laughs> and and I, um, you know, you know, it's just so such a nice thing to not have to think about when you're performing. Right. So something I'm very conscious with if I'm working with younger, younger actors, where they are in their cycle or Right. What have you? What can I do to help you? Yeah, this is my role as IC intimacy coordinator. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because doing that sort of maneuvers when you're on your period as well. Yes, be, yeah. there's a lot to think about, and and I really want to be able to make that as easy easy for them as as possible. Right. You know, it would be great if you didn't have to do your huge love making scene when you are on your yeah heaviest day of your period. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. This you know just stuff that doesn't even spring to mind, but that's why you've been trained to wow. do that. Absolutely. Mm. So did your mother talk to you about it? Were you aware when your mother was going through it or? No and no. And it's not that she was, I don't think she was withholding. I just don't think it crossed her mind to, yeah, to talk about it. Right. No, nobody did. Although I did sort of say probably in the, you know, in the last five, ten years or something, I would have said, hey, mum, how, how was your menopause? And she couldn't remember much about it, which was kind of a good sign, which means it wasn't potentially horrific. Yeah. And I know there is such a variety of responses, Absolutely. the body's responses, mm, you know. Mm. But I'm sure, you know, what your mother had is perhaps in some way indicative of what you might experience. Yes, unless your mother had a hysterectomy when she was 40. And then you just really don't know. <laughs> yeah, then you don't know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I find that a lot of older women have said, oh, I can't remember, it was so long ago. So I find that interesting. But again, as you say, it is probably indicative of how traumatic it was for them. Mm. Or maybe it's like that trauma, we just block that out or something. I don't think I found it traumatic. Well, actually, let me qualify that. Okay. What I found traumatic was that my memory was suffering. Yeah. I would say I've got that back now. Yes. But I went through a period of going, and now I function at quite a high level. I hold a lot of things in my head. I'm Mm. just that kind of person. But just for forgetting little things, mm. and and I was going, 
what are you, how, what? It felt like I'd lost 50% of my memory. 50%? It was probably only like 10%, but it felt like 50. Yeah. So I was just constantly frustrated that I couldn't yeah. hold on to these things. And for an actor. Yes, I was about to say. You know, I'm, I'm used to holding books in my head. Yeah. So how was that? Did you have trouble on set and on stage? No, but boy, I worked hard. Yeah, right. I worked harder during that period of probably going through menopause to to hold on to those things. Whereas the play I just did for Auckland Theatre Company called Two Ladies, which was fast, rapid-fire dialogue, I never left the stage, that wasn't nearly as much of a struggle now that I'm through menopause. Right, okay. Okay, so let's take a step back. So how old were you when it started and how did it start for you? Well, I think I was probably around 50. It probably started maybe perimenopause or late 40s, but probably started sort of dissipating around 50. And then there was a sort of, you know, that mucky period where you sometimes there's a gap between your periods and then it's heavy or it's light and then you think it's stopped and then for four months you don't have one and then it comes back. Right. But I think I was well through it by 55. And it went for five years, that whole thing? I think so. And I remember my doctor saying, look, the 50s can be really tricky because of all these changes in your body. And and I thought about that a lot when I was going through this. And I, I don't think I had wild mood swings. I did get a bit sweaty at night, but not the huge kind of you know, right, massive right. kind of night sweats and blushes. So you never got any hot flashes or anything like that? At night I could feel myself getting a bit sweaty. Right. But the memory thing was the worst, I think, for me. And I did, for a while, I thought, look, I can't be having this memory thing. I just can't be having it. <laughs> I'm, you know, this, is my, this is my working life. So right. I did try for... I want to say three months, maybe HRT. Oh, right. And then I went, mm, no. Right. I just felt sore breasts, didn't feel good, wasn't for me, went off it. Right. And just supplemented that with some decent hormonal support stuff in a more of a, that was more natural. Right. So it was just a general feeling of unease as opposed to any specific symptoms from HRT? Yeah, I just didn't like how my body felt. Right. Yes. Right, okay. Yeah, I just, I didn't like it. I, I felt, it just didn't feel like m- me anymore. And I just went, oh, okay, I understand what's happening. You, your estrogen's levels are going down and all of that. But that's part of getting older. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm not, I just wasn't keen on it. And it's perfect for other people. It's yeah. really perfect. So one person's HRT experience is going to be wildly different from another's. And did you have any other symptoms? Um... Perhaps a little bit more weight going on. Right. And that can be stressful. Um, HRT in particular. Oh, wow. When you when you took HRT? Yes. Yeah. And I so you know, I kept sort of, you know, holding on to my breasts and going, ow, <laughs> ow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Mine are like that before I get my period. And mine are very uh, large. So right. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a double G worth of pain to me. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. Well, I, I don't have... Uh, Yes, I'm not blessed with that. Well, yes, and when you're running up some stairs, you're probably a lot more comfortable than I am. You probably don't have to clasp them when you're running yeah, up some yes, stairs. I don't clasp them now, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, so obviously I was in enough of a mental turmoil to think that I needed to try something. Yeah, and was your doctor good? Yes, yes. Right. Yes. And, um, and then I think maybe I tried it for a month and went, no, this isn't right. And then maybe it was up to something for another couple of months. And then I went, ah, forget it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You, know, you know when it's obvious when you've got some kind of chemical in you or medicine in you or something like that, when there's an obvious change, you just feel different under this medica- on this medication. That's what I felt. And I didn't, I didn't like it. It's because I'm epileptic. So I take pills, two pills a day. And uh-huh. have done since I was 16. And I was talking uh-huh. about this with Tusiata because she's also epileptic. Ah, uh, my father's an epileptic too. Oh, right. Okay. My father. So, I, yes, and he was on medication. Yeah. yeah. So the only difference I could feel when I was young, it made me hungry, but I didn't realize it made me hungry for a uh-huh. long time. So 16 years I changed and then lost some weight, but that was, you know, enough time to be put up for the fat rolls on Shorten Street. And that can be hard and that gets in. And it can be difficult if you're on stage and in the public eye, if you do put on a bit of weight. Did that bother you or are you um, much more ex- No, I, I, honestly, I don't think it was that significant. Right. Okay, great. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. But, but, it, but it felt, I did feel much better going off the HRT. Right. Okay. And then just doing some natural things. And then just time takes care of the rest of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And did you talk to your sons about it all? Because you have two boys. Did that? Um, I don't think I've not talked about it. I mean, hmm, I haven't sort of sat down and had a menopause talk with them, but I'm pretty, and they don't live at home anymore now anyway, but hmm, <laughs> that's a really good question. Yeah, I just feel like it's something that... I'm sure they're aware of it. I, it's not something I'd be be hiding I'm not never embarrassed to talk about it yeah absolutely yeah it sort of feels like something that should be taught at all levels I think just because yeah because you know there's a lot of intolerance around like actually I was listening to an interview with Kim Hill and she got quite defensive with a woman who was saying that we need to make allowances for menopausal women in the workplace because I think she felt that people will take that as an excuse to not employ menopausal women but I think as you know as long as enough people know exactly what it is and that it can be temporary and all that sort of stuff then then we should yes. just embrace it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that, that's why. So I've, I just was on a meeting with women who are in their sort of mid thirties, early forties, later forties. Yeah. So I'm like, talk to me, gals. <laughs> you know, I, let me tell you about it. Right. And watch out for this and watch out for that because no one ever said that to me. Not one older woman ever talked to me about menopause. Yeah. You just suddenly find yourself in it. Yes. Like you know it must be happening, and then you're like. What's wrong? What's wrong? I mean, it, it must be like that for people who've never had a period, and then suddenly they have a period, but no one's ever spoken to them about it. What? What's happening? Yeah, the, the amount of young girls that have thought they were dying, you know, because people haven't yeah. been honest with them about that. Yeah. So once it did start, did you know that's what it was? I know that a lot of people are, just think that they have anxiety all of a sudden and don't realize that it marries up with menopause. So did you know that's no, what it was? I, I guess that's what it was because right. of my age. I guess that's what it was, right. and I hadn't ever had period problems before. Right. So. You know, yeah, I figured that was that was just the start of the process, but you don't know what the ride's going to be. That's it. That's it. And did you research up on it and get sort of worried about what it was going to be, or just decide to flow, take, take it with the non-flow? I certainly researched what might be some good natural health supplements and read all the reviews because they're all the women yeah. using them. And yeah, that's what I mostly did is actually found some some people who were happy to talk about that stuff. Are there any products that you can say quickly that helped you or? Well, yeah, I think that there's one that's a clinician's women support hormone that's very right. good, and you can get that from healthpost.co.nz, and you can read the reviews on it. And they've got if you just if you just Google on Health Post, if you just Googled menopause on Health Post, you'll get like about six products there, and have a good read. And there might be just one if if you don't like one, try yeah. another one. Or if you think HRT is for you. Yeah, and it does seem to be for a lot of people. And particularly now when they have reversed their earlier decisions around it being carcinogenic, which is such a shame because it feels like there's a whole yeah. generation of women that missed out on the benefits that a lot of people feel from it because of that misinformation. But, I mean, medicines evolve, but it just seems to be indicative of a lack of research and understanding into women's bodies to me. Mm. It actually breaks my heart thinking about women who were probably in the throes of some really distressing menopause experience, you know, been thrown into asylums and, you know, Absolutely. They went off their nut because their body was, you know, raging. Yep. And they were shipped off for being hysterical or moody or whatever. Yeah. And same with epileptic women. I would have been burnt at the stake in at certain eras because you were possessed with demons and, and that course, sort of thing. Of yes. course, that makes sense. Yes, and they always seem to do it to women particularly, don't they? Men don't get sort of yeah. diagnosed with hysteria yeah. or, or anything like that. Yeah, I just, I mean, why is women's health being so neglected? Why, what, it's because I think so much of it is around, around shape. The patriarchy has made so much of women's, what happens in our bodies around exactly. shape. Exactly, exactly. And that's a shame. Yes, yes it is. And that's yeah. why it's so important yes. to talk about it, to expose that. Yeah. yeah, because our bodies are pretty damn miraculous. Yeah, Yes. Yeah. And of course, being with the intimacy coordination, you're dispelling shame and things around bodies in the course of that as well. Well, you're really bringing everything. Um, you just make sure that consent is at the heart of everything. Of course. And that people's boundaries are respected. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that working with actresses, I don't know, I just feel like we have so much expectation on us and things. That's why I do solo work generally, because you, you, know, you get put up with enough fat roles and things like that in television and decide you'll just forge your own way on stage, which unfortunately relies on um, an audience at this point. <laughs> but have you found with actresses that they have some sort of innate levels of shame because of they're so judged by the way they look? Um, certainly there would be people, both male and female or men and women, mm-hmm. that 
there are certain parts of their bodies that they would, you know, prefer not to show. And that that's fine. We'll absolutely work with that. Yeah, right. I mean, I think as long as there's communication and transparency right from the very beginning that when they're doing this role, this is a, a requirement for the role and they know what they're consenting to, yeah. they'll generally be, be up for that. But within that, you can also make sure that, you know, if there's something they don't want seen, we can we can work with that. You just edit out my little my fat roll on the side. <laughs> yeah, it might be that you know you're happy for the side of your buttock to be shown, but not your gluteal cleft <laughs> or your bottom. Cleft. Your crack. Your build is crack. You, I like that. Your gluteal yeah. cleft, yeah. right? Do you use words yeah. like gluteal cleft on set? Or? Yeah, we do. Right, because we do because it doesn't infantilize the the actor. We talk about it's not like I'm. Going, mind the gluteal cleft, everybody. I would never do that in front of the, the, the crew. <laughs> but in terms of how I would write my reports or stuff like that or write down what the action was, definitely we use professional language. Yes. I hate a lot of the infantilizing in the media. It's not pejorative. You know, we're not saying, um, you know, it's like if, you, if an actor reads in a script and then he grabs a tit <laughs> and, and then... She grabs his ass, you know. And we don't speak like that. We say, you know, okay, so we're going to have a grip and that might have Heft. quite a bit of uh, what's the tension within that right. grip on the buttock. And it's really good because what it does for the actor is it breaks it down so much that it's a, it's a beautiful right. dance and, it's not, and they're not bringing their own sexuality to it. Uh-huh, right. They're the character's sexuality. We're making a dance for the character's. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting thing. Like when I act, I do sort of heightened comedy stuff and I've never stopped to think about how would this person make love? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, quite, uh, it's like an extension, um, yeah, mm. literally sometimes an extension. That's interesting. But back back to uh, back to menopause. And I was wondering, so your husband is the lesser known actor, uh, Michael Hurst, uh, but did he know anything about menopause or was it a journey for him? No, I don't think he did either. Yeah. I mean, his daughter would never have talked about right. it. Yeah. You know, she was from sort of work, working class St. Helens just out of Liverpool and wouldn't talk about anything like no, that. No, indeed. Yeah, I, I think we're probably now, the young people growing up now will be the generation who are the luckiest. Yeah. And that information will be out there. Absolutely. And as, well, when I was young, there was no internet. So how could I look up these things? Yeah. Who's, who's going to tell me? And yeah, so much silence around this this topic. Absolutely. So it's shouted out. Now, I was wondering, do you know if there are any aspects of Tao Māori about that do you know about menopause? Obviously, I plan to talk to some fantastic wahini who are tangata whenua to tell me more about this. But given all of your work around it, I wondered if you had some insights as well. Yeah. Well, obviously, it's not something, a tikanga that I follow as a, as a Pākehā. But I know that they generally during menstruation that the, the women are considered tapu at that time, mm-hmm. and they were given opportunities to rest during mes- menstruation. And, yeah, the periods were your first period or the, the onset was quite celebrated. I'm right. sure, yeah, which is great, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. It makes a, no- a nice change to trying to hide the tampon in your hand when you're going to the toilet at school and things like that that I used to do. Yes. Yeah. Grim, <laughs> grim, grim, grim. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my mum was quite good at at talking to us about it. Actually, it started, I came home from school in 1979, I guess, I was five, and said to my mother, Mum, is it true that Dad sticks his penis in your bum? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I think, yes, that it's a beautiful thing, uh, or only on his birthday. But (laughs) (laughs) And she was a nurse, so she was quite good around that, but yeah, I still felt that shame and didn't want to let people know. And I think celebrating it is is wonderful. Mm. And when I was talking to Anjum about the Muslim side of things, because when you have your period, you can't pray and fast. So then everybody knows when you've got it. So again, it, it has less shame around yeah. it. So that is something that is interesting and yeah. nice. I love that when you go into many people's bathrooms now, they've just got the tampon sitting there Absolutely. For, for the young women in the house or whoever's there. Uh, isn't that great? Now, we never no more have done that, you know. Yeah. And the fact that the government has got on board with period oh, poverty and supplying those could, could you have even dream? Well, you're much younger than me, but no way would that have been a topic yeah. when I was at, at school. For government. And I yeah. love it that all these young women now at college, there's an opportunity to just have free tampons available. Great. 
yeah, if you caught out all that. Actually, my dad used to do tampon vending machines, which is my dad also used to do condom vending machines. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, he's um Catholic boy, hilarious. Uh, he would sell two for two dollars, or as my dad would put it, buck a fuck. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that gives you a little insight into how I have become no, the way that I. No. I can see where you came from, really, Ashton. Yeah, exactly. Good stock. Quite, I'm also a lapsed Catholic. I call myself such a good lapsed Catholic that I'm a prolapsed Catholic. Ah, <laughs> uh, lovely. Let's hope but nothing else prolapses. I hope so too. I hope so too. That Because I actually started using a menstrual cup and somebody said that can be one of the side effects is a prolapse. Yeah. yeah, see, I've sort of passed by the time menstrual cups came up, you know, that ship had sailed for me. Yeah. They're a fleshy enterprise, but you just you got to get right up in there. And stop. Yeah, I was get up there, get down and dirty. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I've really noticed is that you see a lot of women who've come out the other side of menopause, and I am one of them, who have this sort of renewed sense of vigor, and you know, start businesses, or you know, there you see sixty-year-old women who are just like they're away, they're they're ready to the, the kids have gone, they've had that major parenting part of their life is over. And they, they're just ready to do something new. So I find that really inspiring. And do you feel that yourself as well? Yeah. I mean, look, I have a whole other side of my career as an IC now. Of course. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And that, yeah. that all happened really after menopause. Right. And, and do you mind if I ask how old you are now? I am a, in, what's the date today? Oh, in the 28th. Where are I? What year are we? Yeah, um, it's 2021. On the 8th of November, I turned 59. Right. Okay. Almost almost yeah. there. Right. Okay. And do you think about retiring? Obviously, you've still got ages. No. Of- I don't know that actors ever retire. Yeah. I just play parts where I have to lie down a lot, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give me a stool? Not so much a line, but a chair. A chair, please. Yes. Right. Fair yeah. enough. What, what's what somebody said to Michael once when he was a young actor? Michael said it the feet of this this older actor and Michael's all ready to get the you know the, the pearls of wisdom and the actor said never stand up when you can sit down <laughs> and never sit down when you can lie down <laughs> God, right and yes what not to take into your career um, so, no, look, I'm still I'm very excited about what the future holds because I don't know what that is yeah then if you'd asked me Three years ago, are you going to direct a short film? I would have, I don't think so. I only direct in the theatre. Yeah. No. So stuff comes up, I think, if you're open to it. And I and I think maybe I'm just, now that I'm through that, what is a tricky time, I think, going through menopause, I feel that whatever exciting opportunities are out there, I'm ready for them. Yeah. Yeah. I remember 75 minutes of dialogue and, and things like that when I'm on stage. So it is a little worrying to think. I have heard some people say that the muscle memory sort of memory stuff isn't so bad. Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. 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 And that's, and of course, thank God for rehearsal, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I, I don't rehearse. I've been doing my shows for so long. I don't, but when I do technical rehearsals, they're like, do you want to run the show? I'm like, fuck no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, you are. There is a responsibility for you when you're an actor and on stage. You know, you can't not get your words right. You, yeah, you you let down not just yourself, but all of your fellow actors and the audience who can pick that Absolutely. up. Absolutely. And that's what I think too. It's disrespectful to the audience to not do the work. Sometimes, you know, I've gone to see a show and I just think you just haven't done the work. Yes. Yeah. Marvelous. Right now, I have got my fun fact time. So I've been asking everybody. The the out-of-the-box segment, if you have a fun fact about menopause. Well, a couple of fun, one's more fun than the other, but I thought it was really interesting that the body doesn't stop producing estrogen after menopause. The body still needs some, although in smaller amounts. But so instead, although the estrogen doesn't come from the ovaries anymore, the adrenal glands produce hormones and those and another hormone and they convert them into estrogen isn't that a miracle right yeah so the hormones that the adrenal glands produce are called androgens and aromatase (laughs) you may be reading this well i I had to write those words down and yeah they convert them into estrogen but the more fun fact Uh is that captive female gorillas um, go through physiological changes when their reproductive days are ending. So they go through, they seem to go through not only menopause, but through a perimenopause. So they go through some hormonal changes um, right. in, in gorillas. So isn't that 
flip. It's interesting. Well, now we're getting co- conflicting um, fun facts because Pinky said that the only animals that go through it are whales. So. Ah, well, <laughs> this is a new study um, right. by a primatologist at a, at a zoo in Chicago. So okay, who are looking into it. So I thought that was interesting. I wonder if I wonder if there's something around because you know a lot of women have a lot less severe menopause than others, and maybe their adrenal glands pump out more estrogen than other women, or something to that effect. That would be an interesting thing to yeah, look into. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, we still have to have it, don't we? We still need estrogen in some way for yeah you know, essential hormonal function. Yeah, and I think it's to do with you know bone health and skin mm. and all this sort of stuff. So have you noticed differences with your strength and and things after menopause? Oh, yeah. Mm. Actually, now you say that, I mean, I do try and keep exercise. Yeah, which is a big part of it. Yeah. I don't think I could sort of hold a few of the yoga poses where you're just holding yourself on your hands and your toes you know, in a planky type thing. I'm probably not so good at that. Oh, okay. That's okay. Right. That's okay. I'm just going, okay, body, you're doing what you're doing and you've been good to me so far and... Keep up the good work. So and you, so you've, you're accepting it, you're celebrating it, and you're moving on, and so that's great. Yeah. Well, I'm celebrating it because it's over. <laughs> and you just love not having a period. Well, yeah. Celebrating the body, yes, I am celebrating the body, and it's been a good body. It keeps me moving. It keeps me, you know, I take it out for a walk every day. <laughs> good body. Good body. <laughs> yeah. Good body. Mm. good body. And you don't have to buy nappy sand anymore. <laughs> oh, my God. It's such a relief. You just realise that all of those years, and I was quite late, probably 15 when I first started. Oh, wow. Quite late. And I didn't really grow. You know, I'm tall, I'm 5'11", but I think my major growing came 15, 16, 16, 17, 18. I don't think I stopped growing until I was 18. Okay. You looked at me as a fourth former, you wouldn't say that I was exceptionally tall or anything. Yeah. So everything was, was late. So great. You know, many people get the period at 10. Mm, I did. I did. Yeah. I think that sort of goes with the, the double G cups. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> mm, yeah. The th- yeah. And I, because I'm in that perimenopause, I think, stage where you just get some really heavy moments. I call them lady explosions. <laughs> mm. Have you had anything where you've missed a period yet? No. Only Depot Pro Vera, which I don't recommend. I put on a bit of weight really gradually with Depot without realizing that it's sort of over two years, I suddenly realized I'd put on about four kilos. It's not a huge amount, but as soon as I went off it, that came off. And I wow. did enjoy not having my period for the whole time I was on Depot. But yes. I just decided because I'm epileptic as well, you, it can be difficult around birth control that you might have to take more or this things like that around it. Like I was told that when I was 16. Yes. Also, I should actually mention this more on this podcast that there are certain epileptic drugs that can be very serious to the health of an unborn child, but people aren't told about it. So particularly epilim is really bad. You should not go on epilim when you are wanting to be pregnant, but they don't tell people that. Also, some of these epilepsy medications are prescribed as um, mood stabilizers. So people don't even know they're on an anticonvulsant. They just think they're on an antidepressant, but it can have really serious effects. So it's really, I want to get that information out there as much as possible. There's a group called FACS, which is Fetal Anticonvulsant Syndrome New Zealand, who are all about getting that news out there. But birth control was difficult. So I've just gone bugger it and just we just use condoms because I can't be bothered faffing around with the hormones and all that sort of stuff. We're pretty staunch, aren't we, women? You know, what yeah. we've what we go through, what our bodies go through. Yeah. Yeah, and the two yeah. women particularly that run Facts New Zealand are amazing. Like they both have children that will have special needs requirements for the rest of their life because of this, uh, and they've fought to get them covered by ACC and various other things as well. So, yeah, so they're incredibly resilient. Not only are they epileptic and deal with that, but then they have children that they have to support that way. Well, I I salute those women. Yes. On that group. Absolutely. Absolutely. So do you think you have anything else you might want to say or you've thought about around menopause? Uh, No, that I just will continue to keep talking to women younger than me because I think I could have done that with, with that when I was younger. Yeah, fantastic. And not just from a doctor. Right, yeah. But just when somebody's saying, hey, how's it going? Are you, you know, how are you feeling? Yeah. What's your body doing around menopause? Like I've had a couple of people, I've only done three episodes so far of this podcast saying, oh, I think I might have some symptoms actually. I'm going to go to see my doctors. Or, or other people that go, oh, I'm not sure if this anxiety is actually linked to menopause, as if to sort of make excuses that, oh, it's probably something else, as opposed to it could be something as simple as your hormones are out of whack at this point in time. Mm-hmm. So that the more you ask people about that, and then they might realize that something that's happening is 
is that and mm. can get help if they need or take some supplements and things. Yeah. Mm. So good on you for doing this, Penny. Thank you. Thank you very That's much. It's really, really fantastic. The more the merrier. So, well, I hope that your showy ovaries have a good time in the unruly tourists. <laughs> Thank you. That's going to be so much fun. Yes, it's going to be fascinating and interesting. And that's who would have imagined that that family must be just going, what on earth is happening? Do you really think they even care what's going on in New Zealand? They probably had just they probably just wiped it out of their memories after having such a horrible time down here. I think I think they might be a bit interested that they're the subject of an opera. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably not back to them. I would but, say so. Uh, I imagine the New Zealand Herald is trying to find them to do an interview with them about it. As well. What is it? All good publicity. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Well, on that note, thank you very much for being my fabulous guest, Kakite, and I will see you when we get out of um, jail. Kia ora, tēnei te mihi ki a koe. Cheers. Kia ora. Kia ora. That was the fabulous Jennifer Ward-Leland. A big nā mihi, thank you very much to her. New Zealander of the Year 2020, President of New Zealand Actors' Equity, unruly tourist opera matriarch, and someone who is finally freed from the tyrannical shackles of oppression of tampons. And her enthusiasm about that is quite infectious, though the taking of the five years to get there, less so. But forewarned is forearmed, which is my whole focus of this podcast. It's also great she has renewed vigor to consult on intimacy and it strikes me actually I thought that some people out there might not know what an intimacy consultant is so here's Wikipedia's definition. It is a staff member who ensures the well-being of actors who participate in sex scenes or other intimate scenes in theatre, film and television production. That website for supplements was healthpost.co.nz, where I searched and there were 61 menopause products. I have to confess that I am just a little bit skeptical of herbal shenanigans, but if millions of women find comfort with them, who gives a toss what I think? Just do what's right for you, I say. And I imagine trial and error is quite at play there so do email me if you have some great stories around that also if you want to find out more about getting pregnant when you have epilepsy and fetal anticonvulsant syndrome head to faxnz.com f-a-c-s-n-z.com and if you felt you wanted to contribute to the making of this podcast so we can get the word out to as many women as possible about what might happen to their bits and pieces, head to my Patreon page. You can help with as little as $2 and hello to my newest patron, Anna Forsyth. Hello, lady. You are the best. And it would be even more fabulous if you could spread the word to your various social media networks. You can find me on all the usual places and send me any questions or ideas for guests or date scone recipes. I really bloody love a date scone. Till then, as Pinky Agnew once said, stay juicy. We'll see you next time on Showy Ovaries. <laughs>